Hey now folks, today we're taking a look at King of Tokyo from Yellow Games and the infamous designer of Magic the Gathering, Richard Garfield. But this is not a deeply strategic collectible two-player card game, rather this is more of a beer and pretzels party game where each of the players, up to six players, takes control of a giant monster that's trying to destroy Tokyo and take it over by either knocking out all the other monsters or having the most victory points i.e. glory, honor, renown, whatever giant monsters typically fight over. Now, that probably sounds like a fantastically fun game to you, but looks and theme can be deceiving. Let's take a look at it, and we'll find out if it really is that fun. In King of Tokyo, your goal is to take a giant monster and destroy all the other players or gain enough victory points to become the actual king of Tokyo. So the very first thing each player is going to do is choose one of those very same monsters. And you're going to do that by taking one of these player boards and one of the little standees that represents your monsters. Uh, so some of the options that you have, you have Gigazor, you have the king, Mecha Dragon. The Kraken, Alienoid, and the fan favorite, Cyber Bunny. Now, the important thing to note here is that all of these characters are exactly the same game mechanics-wise. Basically, whatever monster you choose, you're choosing based on whatever one you think looks the coolest. So, whatever is most aesthetically pleasing to you. And all the standees have essentially the same artwork. Now, once you've chosen your monster, you are going to set your life value up to 10. It goes up to 12, but uh, and it also goes up to 11. But you want to want to stay at 10, everyone starts off with. And you're going to set your little victory point counter up here to 0. And like I said, the goal is to either knock every other monster down to 0 life points, or to get your victory point tracker all the way up to 20. You do either of those things, and you win the game. But how does that actually work? King of Tokyo is all about dice rolling. The very first thing you're gonna do at the start of your turn is take all six of these dice and you are going to roll them. You get three rolls of the dice before you must keep whatever you roll. After every time that you roll, you can keep as many of the die faces as you want. You're gonna put them off to the side. So let's say that I, I roll two twos. I'll just put them all over here to the side and then roll the rest of the dice that I have. And I can change my mind the next time I roll. The second time I roll, I might what I might like the other stuff that I roll and decide, okay, I'm gonna have to go after energy now, so I'm gonna go ahead and re-roll these twos. But regardless, whatever you roll on the third time is what you're stuck with. And what do these actually do? Well, first off, let's start with the easy ones, and that's points. So you have ones, twos, and threes. Now, at the end of three rolls, each of those doesn't actually count for points. You need to make sets of three. So if I was to roll three threes, Let's just arrange them like this in case you don't actually know what three threes in a row would look like. <laughs> you would score three points at the end of your third roll. If you actually manage to get more than three threes, each additional three that you have would count as a bonus point. So in other words, for four threes, I would score three points plus one point as a bonus point. Same thing with ones and twos. If I had three ones and an extra one, I'd have a total of two points. And you're just going to go ahead and take your little player board and move your point tracker up, whatever that amount is. Remember that 20 points, victory points, will win you the game. The next thing on the die are hearts. Hearts are very simple. If you have taken damage from other monsters, for every heart that you roll and keep at the end of three rolls, you will heal yourself. So if I was down to seven, roll two hearts, I'd be back up to nine. Very simple. The next side of the die are energy. If you roll and keep energy, you will actually take these little energon cubes, as I like to call them. You get one for every lightning bolt energy die face that you keep at the end. And energy is used for gear cards, as I like to call them. Now, this is the deck of gear cards, and you, there are always three available for you to purchase, and it's always the last thing you do at the end of your turn. The cost for the gear card is up in the top corner, very simple, so when you would want to buy it, you need to sacrifice that many energy cubes. And there are two specific types of gear cards. First, you have discard cards. So you'll see this in the row, and uh, as soon as you buy it, well, first off, as soon as you buy a card, it's immediately replaced, so that there's always three for people to choose from. 
But when it's a discard card, as soon as you buy it, whatever the effect is, happens. So the tanks say that you will gain four victory points, but you're also going to take three damage. The evacuation order says that uh, all other monsters lose five victory points, and it costs seven. And the commuter train says that you just simply gain two victory points. But some of them are keep cards, which means that when they're like equipment. You'll buy them, put, leave them in front of you, and you'll gain a special ability. Extra Head is probably one of the best cards in the game. It actually gives you an extra die, which the game is nice enough to provide for you. There's two extra head cards, so there's a chance that there will be two extra die in the game. Uh, Giant Brain says you can keep it and have an extra reroll each turn, so that's be a total of four rolls each turn. Uh, the Mimic, you can choose a card a monster has in play, put a little Mimic counter on it, and it counts as a duplicate of that card, and the game does provide all these other little extra tokens for the different types of gear cards as a reminders for their effects. Nova Breath, your attacks damage all other monsters. Even Bigger gives you two extra health and also heals you too if you needed it. And so on and so forth. Basically these will break the game in certain ways, which is something that Richard Garfield likes a lot. And it just makes your monsters better if you can afford them. Now let's say that theoretically you did not have enough energy to afford any of the cards in the row. But you want to keep other monsters from getting those cards. So long as you have two energy to spend, you can swipe these cards. You can take all three cards that are out there, put them in the discard pile, and then three new cards come out immediately. You could also do that if you just want to have a better option for you to buy stuff from. Now, there is one more die face that I did not talk about because it is probably the core of the game and requires the most explanation, and that is Claws. Now, at the beginning of the game, no one is in Tokyo. This board represents Tokyo. You have Tokyo City and Tokyo Bay. Tokyo Bay is only used if you have five or six players, and in fact, if you start the game with five or six players and then you a couple of players are knocked out, it will close off Tokyo Bay. But regardless, <clears throat> when you roll Claws, at the beginning, when no one is there, if you... If you roll and keep one claw, whether you like it or not, you take your character standee and you move into Tokyo. The first player that does that goes into Tokyo City, the next player would go into Tokyo Bay. When you go into Tokyo at any point during the game, whether it's City or Bay, you're immediately going to gain a victory point, and there's little reminders of this on the board. If you manage to stay in Tokyo for an entire round, in other words, it comes back to the start of your turn, you'll get an additional two victory points. So it is a way to win the game by having victory points. Now, the problem there's a few problems with this scenario. First and foremost, any hearts that you roll and keep while you're in Tokyo, whether it's the city or the bay, do not count for healing. In other words, unless a card gives you a special ability, you cannot heal while you're in Tokyo. Now, why is that a big deal? Because claws also represent attack. And once someone is actually in Tokyo, if any player outside rolls and keeps claws, I don't know why I just did that, <laughs> every claw that they roll and keep counts as a damage. So if I wanted to attack, if I was a monster outside of Tokyo and I rolled three claws, Mecha Dragon would immediately take three damage, which puts him that much closer to being knocked out of the game. But then something interesting happens. When one player out, so basically, just to make it clear, everyone that's outside of Tokyo attacks everyone that's inside of Tokyo, including if someone is in Tokyo Bay as well. When Tokyo Bay is open with five or six players, the person who uh, rolls claws and damages Mecha Dragon has to go into Tokyo Bay. But after that, whenever players deal damage to the people that are in Tokyo, including if someone uh, who goes into Tokyo Bay would attack that person, the people that are already in there have to make a choice. They could either stay in Tokyo when they take damage, or they can leave. If they stay, nothing happens. They stay there and hope to make it around to their next round and get more victory points. If they leave, the person that damaged them immediately takes their spot. It is possible for both players to leave if, they, if there's both spots are open to this game with five or six players, and then both of them take damage. They can both leave, but still the one player goes into Tokyo City. So, so what's the other upside of being in Tokyo? That's that when those two, one or two players that are in Tokyo roll and keep claws on their turn, their claws deal damage to every other player who is outside of Tokyo. So there's a little bit of push your luck here. Do you stay in Tokyo, chance, uh, take the chance of gaining more victory points, and also being able to hurt every other monster outside of Tokyo, and they don't damage each other? Or, because you can't heal, 
do you vacate as soon as possible because you might die. That's basically the crux of the game. Pushing your luck, using dice rolls, learning what to keep, and learning when to stay in Tokyo, and deciding whether or not you want to try to win by knocking out the other monsters, or winning via victory points. So the unfortunate truth for me is that when most people say that a game is a beer and pretzels game, I just keep right on walking and don't pay attention because to me, most games that people say are beer and pretzels games, and by the way, I don't even like beer and pretzels, really, you have to have beer in order to enjoy them. In other words, a certain amount of inebriation is necessary because otherwise there's just no real game there and it's just not that fun. King of Tokyo is different. King of Tokyo is a fantastically fun game that is the definition of a beer and pretzels game because it's very light, but it's very fast, and it's very, very fun. I'm just going to keep using that word because this game is just great. To say that this was a smash hit is just kind of an understatement, not only in terms of sales. I mean, everybody loves this game, and you'll see it played everywhere if you go to a gaming store, if you go to a convention. Just It's a huge hit, but even within my own group, and by the way, I have, I would say there's a very small percentage of the people in my group who actually like party games, and this would fall into the party category, I think, even though it's a little deeper than, say, you know, Say Anything or Wits and Wagers, but a very small percentage of people actually like party games in general, but even the people that don't, like this game to a degree maybe their mileage varies a bit but everyone if if, we're, if we just need something that's you know under an hour this is the game that we go to and i should mention though and you know i'll sprinkle some negatives about this game throughout all this uh glowing praise is that it feels fast most of the time when it's your turn and turn to turn but king of tokyo can go on a little long sometimes it's just the very nature of the chaotic gameplay that you could feel like you're on the verge of winning and about to knock out all the other monsters, but then all it takes is one gear card to flip the tables, and then that person heals up, and it feels like you haven't really made any progress. But then again, there is a bit of a snowball effect in this game, where once one monster goes down, it just escalates from there and gets very, very fast, or accelerate, I should say. And, you know, this game is not balanced by any means. It's not supposed to be. I mean, like I said, this is a beer and pretzels party game. And the, the, the thing I would say is, don't think too hard about King of Tokyo. Your enjoyment is going to be directly proportional to how much you can kind of dampen your brain a bit and not think about it too much. Because when you really think about it, it's a dice chucking game without a lot of theme. Oh, sure. I mean, it's got fantastic art of these monsters and Thinking about being a giant monster is really cool, but actually getting down to the nuts and bolts of it, it's just a dice-chucking Yahtzee game. Uh, so if you don't think about that too much, and you can kind of just use your imagination and get into it, it's kind of great. I mean, but there's not a lot of strategy here. You can, I mean, you can plan things out a little bit to buy cards that you want. You can swipe cards so that other players don't get them, and do your best to, you know, push to manage your push your luck element there of how you're gonna roll and what you should keep and what you shouldn't keep and what's worth it and what's not worth it. But at the end of it all, your best laid plans can just be totally trashed by someone rolling six claws <laughs> when you are when you thought you were safe at six life. Or, you know, everything can just change by someone just buying a gear card that gives them an extra die or just totally messes up the other players. Those are the kind of things that you have to go into King of Tokyo knowing that are going to happen. And, you know, if you watch my review of Galaxy Trucker, you know that I typically do not like games that are just random chaos like that. But King of Tokyo is, even when it drags on a bit, it's still relatively fast. It's still fun. Rolling a ton of dice, I don't care what game it is, that's just fun. <laughs> there are games that I hate that have really cool dice mechanics that come very close to saving it. Fortunately, with King of Tokyo, it is the base mechanic of the game. It's very cool, and it works well. And yeah, the theme is not that great. It's kind of pasted on, but man, <laughs> I love the artwork, and it's just cool thinking about being a giant monster. So if you can just shut your brain off just a tiny little bit, I think you will find this to be a fantastic game. Somewhere between filler and light game comes King of Tokyo. Great for a lot of groups. Great for every group I've ever been with. And there's a reason why it gets played so much. So, my name is Nick. This is Board Game Brawl, reminding you to get out there and game every day and in every way. Take care.